But I know that um, when one of the things that the basic scientists and the clinicians are now thinking about is when, let's say you have a diagnosis, mm -hmm. whether you're a teenager or whether you're 60, um, what actually happened to get to that? In other words, if um, you, you have a seizure and that brings you to a neurologist and you're diagnosed with epilepsy, wh when was the start of that? Can we intervene um, and have um, uh, some kind of a novel way of um, preventing you from even getting to that first seizure? And that, um, that process where there's an event um, and then you develop epilepsy, it's called epileptogenesis. So the idea here is an anti-epileptogenesis strategy. And in um, aging, it's really difficult, um, but I think it's really important because it's, it's, it's really a prevalent population. The reason why it's difficult is that there's um, usually such a confluence of genes, um, the environment, past history, maybe other medications, all of which could contribute to that first time the person has a seizure. I, one of the things our lab is very um, excited about is um, menopause and andropause and how that might be um, really important in taking what is normally never going to develop into epilepsy, but because of that time of life and the hormonal changes, um, all of a sudden it comes to the surface. And that's been in the literature for a long, long time, but been really hard to get at. So I think that um, we'd really like to work on that an awful lot more. And the animals that we work on, like the um, mouse and the rat, you'd think that they would have little to offer, but they have very short lifespans compared to humans. So you can actually look at their aging a little bit easier. It's not, it's, nothing's ever easy, but, um, that I think is a great opportunity um, for us. So our lab's um, trying to do that actively. Well, one of the things that I think we need is we need to start um, early on educating people about what seizures are and a little bit more about epilepsy because I think what I think the primary problem is that in, in this in psychiatry, a lot of the fellows and residents who I talk to, they've had a little bit about what epilepsy is, or for example, the PhDs in neuroscience, they have a little bit, but they really don't have a good feeling for what epilepsy is, and that makes it hard for them to um, uh, kind of get excited about what could be this marriage between, or, or let's put it this way, maybe we don't have to divide psychiatry and neurology as much as we currently do. So I think it would be very exciting to try to get in at, um, at early on in education at a number of levels just to have all the folks who are going into psychiatry, neurology, and neuroscience understand epilepsy a lot more, have sort of a comfort level with what, what the people like Dr. LaFrance know like the palm of their hand. And I think that we would all um, be able to talk up at the same table a lot more easily. And um, things like epilepsy wouldn't be foreign to people who study geriatrics. And um, I think we'd come a long way there because I think that's what's creating some uh, pushback, is that people just think epilepsy must be so vastly different that they can't understand how it could be relevant to their patients or their uh, research. Mm -hmm. And it's actually um, much more common and, uh, to me, much more of a continuum than most people would exam, you know, most people would assume. So I'd love to try to get at education, but having said that, it's really hard to change curricula. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I think it takes a lot of people, and I think um, you can't do this alone. So I'm hoping that more people get excited. And then that's the idea behind the SIG, mm -hmm. the special interest group, get a lot of people talking about the same thing, and then we all work together.